turn some bass in there. One to your mouth. A slip of willow, 15 inches long, half pushed into the ground, given sufficient moisture, will root and become a viable plant, productive for probably the next 30 years, growing between 5 and 10 feet in one season, depending on the weather. of land drainage, part of the Somerset levels still has a sufficiently high water table to support the commercial cultivation of willow beds. <laughs> These low, flat moors of central Somerset were covered by sea. The inhabitants lived on islands, principally Glastonbury, the fabled Isle of Avalon, until the pressure of an increasing population stimulated efforts to drain the surrounding inland sea with dikes, reams, and in more recent times, pumps. The moors around King Alfred's refuge, the Isle of Athelney, have for generations been a centre for the production of willows, for the manufacture of baskets and furniture. My great-grandfather, William Gadsby, started basket making in Stratford, London in the year 1864. He was followed by his son, Robert Gadsby, and then by my father, who is now almost 90, William Gadsby. And so you will see, we are a family business. The basket making all took place in Stratford, London, where they had a workshop where the employees would make the baskets and they also had a retail shop. The type of baskets which were both made and imported in those days are almost identical to the type of baskets which we make and import today. So there has been very little variation across the years. Unfortunately, the 1939 war made a big difference to all our lives. And in 1941, Adolf didn't seem very happy with us and our home was almost destroyed. And so we took a leap in the dark and came down to Somerset. Father had to make the decision whether we were going back to London or going to stay in Somerset. As far as I was concerned, the decision had already been made because down here it was like heaven. It was peaceful and we could get about and thoroughly enjoy ourselves. And so it wasn't long before he came to the same conclusion. And fortunately, he was able to obtain a building down here on the main road and started basket making there again. Obviously, willows weren't a problem because they were growing all around us. And so that was the beginning of our roots in Somerset. Now, our own business 
is the supply of baskets, both our own manufacture and from all over the world. Not only do we import basketware, but fortunately we export basketware. Some to places which even startle us, like Japan. But it's a two-way thing. These are a few examples of our locally made baskets, all made from Somerset Willow, made by our employees. And as you will see, they're good and sturdy and strong and long lasting. Now, in comparison, many of the imported baskets are much more delicate and light. As you will see, if you look here, there's this type of thing. And, and again here, another type of little basket. But do remember, they're all handmade using the same principle, whether we make them here or whether we import them. And it's a craft, the and the people that make them are craft people. And I think we should respect that, that a person can, with their own hands and a small amount of material, create something which is both nice to look at and practical. And I think this is important to bear in mind that the person gives part of their life, like the potter, when they create that basket, whether it be made in Somerset or whether it be made in China, the same thing applies. Inspired by the example of nest building birds, Early man wove grasses and twigs into baskets and hurdles, one of the earliest technologies predating pottery. Some early pottery is decorated with incised marks, recalling a culture with only woven receptacles. The principal techniques have remained the same for thousands of years. Basket making has gone on from the beginnings of time, even Moses had a cradle made of bulrushes, which is the same principle as we use for basket making. I started straight from school. Um, didn't have a job. It was near home. What well, was then? I was working at the state, the other workshop. Um, coming from North Curry, so it's the nearest one besides Tolton. So I come on a manpower scheme. Which was not a lot of money a week. Six months training, that was. After training, I went straight on the piecework. Uh, so been here now, nearly seven years. So I was taught by a man called Ed Dare, which in my opinion, he was, you know, he was one of the best. He was no, he was uh, 61 when he taught me. I was the last person he taught before he died. Basically the same skills he used all the way through the work. Um, mainly it's in your eye. Being able to see what's wrong before it goes wrong. A few people come in during the summer, but a lot of them are totally ignorant to the fact what you're doing. You know, some people even come in and think, oh, you know, you don't wear your dark glasses then. What dark glasses? Oh, I thought you were blind. Or, you know, or some one person come in, do you go home? You know, do you go back to the um, to your to the home, to the home? I said, what are you talking about? I thought you come from an institution. You know? Oh, well, there's a lot of drawbacks. Uh, within reason, it depends what you're doing. Um, if you're on small jobs, it's not so bad because you're up and down all day. You know, small dog baskets, cat baskets. Uh, not. But then when you're on large hampers, large pits, if you sat down for large, long spells of time, especially during the winter, you don't have a, the uh, piles that come along. Or then during the summer is the other drawback that uh, sweat. Uh, run down your back, and with the dirt and dust, picks up, you get spots. Um, I have always looked upon this as a craft. Obviously, you've got pride in your work. Um, I can't help that. That's the only downfall. I'd get out if I didn't. I wouldn't put up with it. Um, I don't know. This is the point that when I was at school, I would work, I was useless. Teacher used to knock me about the egg with what I used to make. You know, you reckon that's all it was useful for. Um, metal work, I was a bit better. 
and I end up basket making. And it don't make sense, but. Louis Boubier is in charge of the cultivation and preparation of the willow for Gadsby and Son. During the winter months, when conditions allow, he works in the willow beds, cutting the willow that he will be processing throughout the rest of the year. Well, we've been brought up in, into willow work and just one of those things, you just get it in your blood and you can't get it out. And uh, when I left school, I went into the trade. Well, it's just hard work, really. It's one of the hardest jobs of all. Yeah, I wish we were here right down the end of March. Well, the trouble is, it's, this time of year, we've got so much frost and wet will stop us from working. Some of the weeks you can only put in, say, a day, some weeks, and another day, week, it might be only two days. And you'll be, get beyond with your work. The skill is cutting round your stump, keeping your stump tidy. With a machine, he just goes over and make a mess of it. And you go have a machine and beat your stumps all the pieces afterwards, try to get it back tidy, but you still can't do it. And there's some work that we done then. Because he cut and chucked it all over Willy bed, you got to pick me up. That's a job. Only trouble is, when you cut it the wrong way, and then you beat your stumps about, you, do, you don't get so many willows following your year. Your willow bed will buy, you know, a good bed, but as soon as you put a machine in, you finish them. You don't last many years.
How does this job affect your health? Oh, I don't think it hurt your health. It might hurt your back, but not your health. <laughs> Nearly all the people I do willy work, they live to a ripe old age. <laughs> My father done it all his life. He's coming 84. Does he ever come out now? No, no, he doesn't come out now. <laughs> you can't keep him away. <laughs> no. He's always outside, though, but uh, he don't come out no more. No, I, yeah, I can go back. All the old people that done willy work, they always live to a good age. I think they keep yourself fit. So you don't like being indoors? No, I don't. I wouldn't work in a factory, not at any price. But you've had back trouble. At, at oh, this. yeah, well, everybody, man, I would have worked to get that. You, we, that's just one of those things, is just it? Just one of those things you live with. <laughs> <laughs> the bundles of cut willow are brought out of the beds and taken to Gadsby's yard at Stace, where they are sorted into lengths spread out to dry and processed to produce the materials needed by the basket makers. There's different jobs you'll be on doing all day long. There's mostly sorting and uh, well, then you've got to spread, you know, what is you've got to be turning up and, sp and spreading all the time. You've got five minutes of break. There's always something you've got to be looking at. There's only two sorts of willows, that's the buff and the white. Unless there's green, you can sell, you can sell a green, like with the peel on. They use it for making crab baskets. That's the only ones that they use for that, or making hurdles. Most of it's done buff and white. To produce the two different colours, buff and white, two different methods of preparation are used prior to stripping off the bark. David Corrie works with Lewis in the yard. For white, bundles of willow are stacked standing in two or three inches of water over the winter in the pit and left there until the sap rises and leaves appear. Then the bark is stripped off before the new season's growth begins. Boiled. We start in the morning, first thing we do is come down, clean the ashes out, light the boiler up, then we fill them up, the willows. You've got to keep E going all the time, about every hour you've got to put coal in. We are not hardly up to date with the modern ones where they put all, you know, got it all oil heated. We're still doing it the old fashioned way. And then we carry on then and keep, keep them boiling for eight hours. If it's late, maybe he hadn't done his time before five o'clock, we got to come back afterwards and keep him boiling until we done our time. One more six foot. When you've done his eight hours boiling, they're cooked. If you, do, if you don't do eight hours, you've got trouble. You can't get the pill off, they'll come out white, half cooked. The boiling not only loosens the grip of the bark on the wood so that it can be stripped off, but also the pigment in the bark dyes the wood to produce the buff colour. Then we leave it for a couple of days and take the own strip back. And just carry on all the year round. Same job. Strip 
Stopping the bark is done by machine. spread day out for what well, could be a week. It's all according to the weather. If it's wet weather, could they could be out any up to three weeks. And then we're in trouble. They start to go mouldy and spotty and then we got a lot of work to do. After they be dry we top wad them up then and take them in and start store they for the basket maker. It was a very good job, it's hard work, but it's a good job of work. And to the job after you finish your doing your woodles you 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 see you know, see what you've done. It's like other jobs where you carry on all the time and after you finish you haven't got no night to show for it. Fortunately, it's still a family business. My son is more or less running the show now because I'm getting to the age when I'm thinking of retiring and my daughter has worked for many years my daughter-in-law and son-in-law are also in the firm and so we hope there is still going to be a future from what great-grandfather started that the family business will still go on and maybe grandchild we have got and any other grandchildren will be able to step in and take their place and carry the business well on into the next century. Why not? If I'm one of the last people doing it, I just don't enjoy it. I, I wouldn't be able to stand, you know, stuck in a factory, you know, um, putting nuts and bolts together, type of thing. I couldn't get naffed off for that and I'd be out within a week or something else. I suppose this is the same kind of thing as production work or production line work or whatever, but you're making the whole thing yourself. When you finish, you know, you make that, you know. I've been in a willy wool business all my life because my father used to do it. And time never alters, always the same. Always hard work. And can you see it changing? The only thing I see changing is just cutting. I think it's got to change the machine work. Because I don't think you can get anybody to do it. Around here now, there's only the old people what is cutting. You don't see any young chaps cutting with them. And, and do you think that will spoil the trade? Well, to make the trade a bit, make wool, wool scarce, I think. In, I think you give it another 20 years, willies will be getting scarce. Because I can go back now where there used to be hundreds of acres around here, but there isn't a quarter of it now. At least hundreds of acres. Mm -hmm.